Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. But dear brothers and sisters, we are here again in Makkah and we are still enjoying the fever pitch nature of the Hajj, the anticipation of the Hajj, the beautiful days of Dhul Hijjah itself. Alhamdulillah. What it does it feel to be here is something spectacular. I mean, we had Sheikh Faisal Bodhi earlier on and he was just explaining to me he had a dream. And listen to this dream. He goes, he was told to go to the Kaaba. So he went to the Kaaba to pray Salah just as a normal person does. So he's sitting there ready for Salah. And then on the speaker phones, it says, uh, Sheikh Faisal Bodhi, please lead the Salah. And he goes, me? He goes, you must mean someone else. He goes, no, you, Sheikh Faisal Bodhi. And from that, he took that as an indication that he should come to the Hajj. Look at how, uh, how beautiful. There's so many meanings on so many levels. Alhamdulillah, in our tradition of Islam, there is dream interpretation. And I'm sure if there's an expert out there, we'll be able to interpret that in a really, really positive way. But we don't need to have just in dreams or interpretations or signs. It's something that is a fundamental in our religion. And we encourage people to do Hajj when they are young, not when they're old but when they are young and if you have if Allah SWT, uh, offers you the opportunity to go when you're elder uh, elder older elder older yet yeah, older then you have the chance to go inshallah alhamdulillah so please we we give you this one piece of golden advice don't think that i'm going to wait till my sins grow up to be as big as a mountain don't wait till the children are older you may not reach that point you may not reach that point so when you have the chance and you have the funds available just go take your wife take your husband just go and then leave everything else behind alhamdulillah so without further ado we're gonna go to my guests who have been sitting here patiently mashallah i have brother hassan assalamu alaikum hassan wa alaikum and i got alaykum. brother haroon yeah i'm just about to forget your name but alhamdulillah i remember <laughs> alhamdulillah uh, brother hassan uh, you're here performing your hajj but you have some special technology that you are uh, pushing out there which is called Haji Advisor is that correct that's right yeah and what's what's Haji Advisor um, in essence it's a Hajj review site yeah very similar as the name suggests to TripAdvisor and it's focused um, purely just on Hajj companies and why do you think that we need as Muslims we need a uh, an app or a website that reviews uh, Hajj operators I think just as we would go out for a meal or booking a hotel, we, we research it and we see what the pros and cons are. And um, Hajj is a lifetime decision. You know, it's uh, such a so you need to go with the right people. Of course, of course, and you need to see you know what the pros and cons are, um, and also uh, just look out for any other bad apples. Um, and similarly, um, see what all the benefits are for some of the good companies out there. This website is a non-profit uh, website. Right, that's right, yeah. Why, why did you decide that it's going to be non-profit, it's going to be non-advertising? Because obviously you can make money out of this. Yeah. So the reason why we wanted it to be a non-profit initiative is we felt that if there was an element of advertising in there or there was some kind of financial sway in there, it, decisions would be unbiased. So, you know, we wanted to kind of uh, ward that off. So let's just say, for example, a Hajj company was always advertising to be on the homepage and they had loads of bad reviews or they weren't a good company just because they're advertising they would always appear on there and subconsciously people would click on that hedge company um, it should just be based on the merits of um, you know uh, the values of their company how good they are um, and on their reviews that should be the only so merit. what's the points that you uh, review the hedge companies how, how does one go through and the steps to go through to re review a organization so first and foremost you can't uh, post anonymously um, so it avoids kind of malicious reviews you do need to do a very simple like, two-step kind of registration just email address and verify your email address similar to any other kind of review site that you would go to and then there's points that you'll review such as value for money um, accommodation transport um, organizational skills and uh, you know just the general overview of the company itself now you said one of the uh, factors was value for money we know that Hajj is very expensive nowadays. Uh, how do you counter that in your kind of review web website? I think it's about expectations um, and reality. So uh, people do need to understand the costs of our Hajj are rising. 
um, for things which are out of the control of Hajj companies. Um, there needs to be a lot of education uh, about this. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I do come to Hajj regularly and I see the changes year on year. Um, increases in taxes and so forth and increases in rates as well as a weakening currency so um, there's many factors which increases and drives up Hajj prices uh, I don't just think it's every year all the Hajj companies decide let's uh, make it more expensive uh, and more out of reach for people um, I think it's just something that they have to pass on to the customer Alhamdulillah now brother Haroon you're actually a, a, a client let's say of Hajj you, you are. Would you be willing to use a website like this to uh, review your Hajj company that you've been with, or any Hajj company? I can see the value of um, such a company because okay. um, <clears throat> when one looks for a Hajj operator to go with, you have to have confidence that they're going to actually deliver a Hajj in the form and in the manner that you are expecting, and that they have the skills and the um, team on the ground to deal with any um, problems that may arise. You know, Hajj is not a simple ritual it's very very complicated it's in a foreign country there's a lot of lot of um, logistics that got into it. I've been here only for a few days and I've seen the amount of legwork and the amount of fixing that goes on from the local operators just to ensure that the Hajis arrive at their hotel at a reasonable time so I can see the value of this I've heard anecdotal experiences from various other people who've been on Umrah and Hajj about I wouldn't call them rogue operators but operators who have failed to deliver a journey that met people's expectations so yeah early days is it early days for your company yes um, okay. v very much early right, days right, yeah. Yeah. But I can see it delivering value over the longer term sure. now uh, when you took the decision to go to Hajj yes uh, what kind of steps did you go through to kind of check different organizations different operators none none you just said I'm going none whatsoever so for me um, my trigger for Hajj it just occurred to me one day that it's overdue Okay. Literally, the Friday khutbah that week was about how the when was that? Which Friday khutbah? This was three weeks before I before we came out. You're a late start because I know a lot of three, people make that before. decision in Ramadan. No, no, no. no. This, is, this is three talking. weeks no. before Hajj. A, a very, very small number of weeks before we set off. Yeah. And so the Friday khutbah was about everyone who has the means, the funds, the opportunity, and they're not they're not grasping that rope. And therefore, I said to myself, that's strike two. Then I picked up, you know, I know um, f family members who've traveled with the operator that I came with, and I picked up the phone to them and I said, do you have an, another spot available for me? And they said, absolutely, we've got a space available for you. And that said to me, he said, strike three. So y you felt it in your heart, this was the time? It just clicked. I just woke up one day, I spoke to some friends at work, yeah. and I said, is there anyone interested in going on Hajj? And everyone had an intention and everyone wanted to go and everyone had plans to go next year or the year after. And I said, I can't wait. For me, it's now, and I've got to move now. And so that's what I did. So how did you inform your family? Um, did you just come back from the masjid? Oh, by the way, I'm going Hajj. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would have been yeah. a bombshell. So you know, immediate family, wife, kids—they were all very, very understanding, very excited. Parents were, you know, Subhanallah, he's going finally. You know. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah. So you just, you just dropped it on them. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you prepare to? go to the Hajj and I know you had a short space of time yeah. from the time that you uh, made the decision and you actually departed but yeah. what kind of preparations did you do to prior to leaving for Hajj? So Hajj um, again anecdotally I've heard from people people make it more complicated in my opinion that it needs to be or that it should be so the rituals involved are very very pure they're relatively simple to perform. And of course, there's strict rules that you have to adhere to. But if you follow the prescribed steps, inshallah, you should have a successful or more successful hajj. I think where people say, oh, you cannot do this, or you cannot do that, or you must behave in a certain way, they overcomplicate things. And it's not supposed to be a complex, stressful ritual. It's a test for us. You know, it's a journey for us. It's our, you know, reestablishment of our connection with Allah. Right. And therefore, something like that cannot have unnecessary burdens or unnecessary complications so for me it was finding the documentation and there's loads of guides that you can download on the internet and pretty you know you can w weed out the ones where people have started to invent things and so I found a few guides on online that were very very pure they explained the essence of, of Umrah what you must do what you must not do you know the conditions for example for Iran how to maintain it what, what do to violate it or invalidate it and similarly for Hajj so but, but when you go with a travel agent uh, 
and an operator that goes for Hajj, they provide uh, guides that would actually take you to the Haram and say, look, this is this and explain it. Because I know, uh, even from my own experience, mm -hmm. I was reading a book. Reading a book and actually seeing it and actually doing it is two different things. Uh, they're worlds apart. They're worlds, they're worlds apart, apart, yeah. There's nothing that compares to physically being here and being hit with the awesome power of the Gawa. There's nothing compares. Nothing compares to it. Yeah. Nothing compares to it. Hassan, for you, is it like reading a book or the actual practical? What what kind of triggered you to kind of go for the for the Hajj? So, um, because I've performed Hajj a number of times, yeah. uh, I think there is a very crucial element of the Hajj which comes down to literature. So, um, the company who I'm with this year, um, they've released a travel guide, and it's not just a uh, a spiritual travel guide it's a practical Hajj travel guide and it's out of you know I'm fortunate enough to see the works of a lot of the companies um, and it's probably one of the most comprehensive guides that I've seen so it for example will tell you the etiquettes of room sharing um, it will tell you stuff like what to expect at Jeddah airport these are the things which no one's gonna really tell you yeah uh, so you're gonna wait there a long time at <laughs> Jeddah airport uh, uh, Alhamdulillah I mean this year we were it was uh, reasonably quick very very quick Alhamdulillah yeah Okay, and also uh, in regards to the sh room sharing, I mean, people don't expect that there's going to be four people in one room. They think maybe that I'll get two rooms, or uh, I'll, I'll be my wife will be here. Obviously, they may be sharing with other sisters or etc. Like that. Should people be worried about these kind of things, or should they accept that as part of the Hajj? So when went to the Hajj seminar with um, uh, with a company that we we've come with this year, um, Dom they um, actually made us aware of this in the seminar that look this is what to expect so they kind of laid out all the expect this is what the first thing i mentioned to you was expectations versus reality so all of the expectations um were given to us from the very start that look this is how it's going to be this is even before the booking process so uh, you know ex this is what in my eyes makes a good hedge company uh, and a trustworthy hedge company where they tell you everything before you even book with them so you know exactly what you're getting in for so there's no kind of nasty surprises that oh hang on a minute that was a little ambiguous you didn't really state that in your package uh, but they tell you all of this beforehand and they had um, their own YouTube channel and a lot of the videos I went and you know looked up on that well, I think a lot of people would uh, also say something when you have this package of shifting and non-shifting yeah. some people don't understand that uh, meaning that you 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 have a shifting package which means that you move from the haram itself and you go towards Azizi or, or Shisha or something like that just before the Hajj with nothing wrong with it but some people think oh I, I will be in the haram all the time yeah. so is that clearly spell, spelt out on most uh, Hajj companies websites according to the reviews that you received so um yeah, they, they do have to stipulate whether it is shifting or non-shifting, you know, yeah. that's quite apparent. Um, I've actually been on both shifting and non-shifting and the two packages are worlds apart, as, as you know. What's the best package then? Um, of course, non-shifting because yeah. we always get to keep a room yeah. uh, in the harem. You can stay in the harem, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, that's uh, one of the most important things to be able to retain a room in the harem during the crucial days of Hajj. Okay, alhamdulillah. Now, uh, Brother Harun, mm -hmm. are you on a shifting package or a non-shifting? Non-shifting. Shifting, okay. And how have you found the experience so far? You say you were on over 110%, so I don't want to know where you've been, but you're down to 110%. My energy now. levels and my excitement is now down to 110%. 110%. Yeah, That's because I haven't slept. <laughs> you haven't slept. <laughs> but do you have to re make sure that you reserve enough energy for the actual Hajj yes, itself? Yeah. How did you prepare yourself spiritually for the Hajj? Spiritually, um, I don't think there's much you can do to prepare, prepare yourself spiritually other than, you know, do what you can to be a good Muslim. You know, Hajj is a right that every Muslim has to go through. There are, of course, you know, prescribed du'as and, you know, etc. that you have to learn. And, you know, you, you must make sure that you're fully up to speed with what is required of you in order to have a successful Hajj. But in terms of... For me, you know, the switch turned overnight or, you know, instantly. So there wasn't a ramp up where I was planning for a large number of years or months or even weeks to say, I'm intending to go off for the Hajj. What do I need to do? For me, it was the reverse. So I had decided and then I needed to catch up. Okay. Yeah. So if someone experienced that, do you think just go with your heart and go? Absolutely. 
Okay, alhamdulillah. I would endorse that 100%. If you have the means and the opportunity, and it's the time, and there's a slightest trickle that says to you, go, seize the opportunity. How was the Umrah for you? When you Epic. saw the Kaaba for the first time? Epic. I know Epic. this is your first yes. trip to Saudi Arabia, first trip yeah. uh, doing the Umrah and the Hajj. That's correct. So seeing the Kaaba for the first time. That's correct. Good on TV or good seeing it? With your eyes. It doesn't compare. It doesn't compare. It does not compare. It's pretty big, isn't it? So the, the 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 beauty of the Kaaba and the power of the Kaaba is that it is dwarfed by these immense buildings and they are below it. It is this small, unassuming building that has the power. And you can build whatever structures you want around it. The power that emanates from the Kaaba cannot be reproduced. And it does not need these buildings around it. That's the power that I felt because I was very um, concerned about how the Kaaba was being overwhelmed yeah. by all of the skyscrapers that surround it. And then on arrival here, you ignore all of them. Yeah, That's the building. Well, I, I suppose you definitely need these rooms because it's uh, over two and a half million. Oh, uh, that's a given. Hujaj coming in. That's a given. Thing, and you need to facilitate them. That's and a given. We have to, uh, you know, uh, thank the authorities for facilitating. I know they spent... Uh, maybe year, uh, months leading up to the actual yeah. Hajj, preparing Absolutely. Arafah, preparing yeah. Muzdalifa, preparing all the facilities for the Hujaj, alhamdulillah. Absolutely. So on that point, you know, they score top marks, alhamdulillah. Of course, I mean, the buildings around the, the Kaaba perform an important function. The Kaaba, you know, they put, they put this area on the world stage. Yes. Everyone knows the clock tower. Everyone knows the clock tower. You recognize it. Before I came out on the Hajj, I was talking to my colleagues at work. And we were talking through, explaining to them the rituals of what was involved in Umrah, what was involved in the Hajj, the fact that it's based around the life of the Prophet uh, Abraham and his family and his descendants and so on and so forth. And everyone knew the clock tower, but the clock tower facilitates, you know, the Kaaba facilitates all of this. Yes. The it's Kaaba, you know, it's the power resonates from the Kaaba. It's the power. Yeah. Now, we're a few days away from the actual uh, Hajj itself. What are you looking forward to? I know it's a very generic question. Uh, yeah, I mean, wh where do I start? So, you know, we've literally, so what we've been doing every day, we've been planning with, with, with some of the other uh, people who've been on this trip. What are we going to achieve today? How do we maximize our time in the harem versus sleep, rest, nourishment, and preserving our legs for the days of Arafat and the day of Eid? So that's the planning that we've been doing. So we're now going to be entering into those stages with our um, Hajj operator to work out the logistics of what we need to take with us, how we're going to get there, what are our expectations of how the next few days are going to, are going to pan out. Yeah. Because the Hajj changes year on year. There's massive investment in infrastructure. So the information you have from last year or two years ago is out of date. May not be relevant by the yeah, time you get there. Of course. So these, 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 these data points that the operators are providing us are invaluable. Hassan, uh, for a person who's been on Hajj numerous times and Umrah, uh, what kind of advice would you give our viewers? Um, just as Brother Harun mentioned, um, I just wouldn't delay. Um, I think the younger you are to perform your Hajj, uh, you know, don't look at whether you're married or whether you're taking your family with you or not. If you yourself can afford to go, then just, just take that step. Um, and a lot of people, um, as, as Brother Harun was mentioning, they you know, feel like, oh, I need to be at a certain spiritual level yeah. to perform Hajj. The purpose of the Hajj is, is rebirth. So uh, you also mentioned, you, know, you don't have to have a stack of sins um, to then go and perform Hajj and think, right, now I'm cleansed. Because first of all, we, we pray that we get a, an accepted Hajj in Mabru. Um, but the, the second thing is that Hajj is a turning point of your life. So hopefully when you perform it, it will bring about that change. So let's just say you're not at the level you want to be at. Well, hopefully maybe by performing that Hajj, it will then encourage you to perform the five daily prayers or to, you know, stick to Siyam or, you know, uh, just bring about, even if it's one quality in your life that makes you a better so person. So Hajj can be the catalyst for your change in your life? Of course. Life. Yeah. It has to transform you. Has to, you have to return transformed. Do you think that you've, you've been on Hajj a few times, every time you go, does it... Uh, energize you does it become a catalyst because sometimes for people who are, alhamdulillah they are the chosen ones who get to go often let's just say often does it become like oh that's just normal to me now um, I was actually discussing this with somebody today um, that a lot of people they make the assumption that you go all the time uh, you know what's it like when you see the Kaaba or when you're leaving the Kaaba and I was explaining to the brother that look um, I think the more times I go the the more distressful it is when I have to leave Makkah, when I leave the Kaaba. Um, uh, you become more attached to it. The more you come, the more, you know, your heart kind of 
grows fond of this place, especially Makkah. Um, and when I see the Kaaba, it is just as if it takes my breath away. It's like the first time. So I'm in awe every single time, the first time um, I enter into the Haram. Um, and, uh, you know, I come multiple times a year. But still, when I leave, I'm like, am I ever going to step foot in this place again? Because Allah is that longing is, to be back? It's the longing to return and um, it's uh, nothing can be, you know, the, the buzz uh, of being here. And this coming in other times of the year, but coming during Hajj, um, it's, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's banquet. It's, it's the biggest party of the year. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, it's... Everyone's at the party. Yeah, it, it's epic. It's a really kind of, uh, you know, like you mentioned, there's a real buzz that you feel. I've noticed that buzz because straight after the Jamrat and the, the, the two, three days of uh, stoning, a lot of people like high-fiving each other. They're like, yeah, I've done it now, alhamdulillah. And you can see the kind of, they're, they're smiling and that smile does not stop for weeks and weeks on end. Uh, do you experience that same thing? We actually, I go through some of the pictures after Hajj and um, we were looking and there was one <laughs> brother who was really, you know, sad, struggling to, yeah, <laughs> struggling to, um, you know, to, to make the walk and, you know, he'd had an exhausting day and he was just so elated and so happy and I was like, this guy was really struggling to make that walk but just look at the smile on his face. Um, and that's because he would just completed uh, Jamarat and uh, for him it was like, you know, what he'd set out to do. He did it. He did it and, you know, uh, inshallah Allah, Allah gave him an accepted hajj. But um, that joy and that elation, you, you really can't describe it. Harun, to come back to you, mm -hmm. one top advice that you would give our viewers as being as someone who's just come to hajj for the first time? Yep. Top advice. Yes. What is your top, top advice? Pack light and just do it. Pack light and just do it. Just do it. Alhamdulillah. I think that is top advice. Yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. And yourself? I would say, um, I'm going to say this because of uh, Haji Advisor, but research the company you're going with. Um, it is a, a once in a lifetime journey for most people. So you want everything to be perfect. So do look into the operators you're going with and do make sure that you know, you're know you getting what you pay for as well. Can Muslims, is it, some, some Muslims feel like uh, that they're being greedy if they're saying, I'm expecting perfection. Is that something that's a normal guilt? I don't think, uh, you know, expecting perfection is, is a little bit too much, but just um, expecting for the company you've chosen to deliver what they have promised is it's a given um, and uh, I'm not going to say rogue traders but there's a lot of people out there that under deliver so um, it's just ensuring that you know if they have taken um, your for, for many people you know life savings you need to ensure that what you have advertised is what you are going to deliver to you know uh, people who have saved up for years um, if not longer for this journey Alhamdulillah to brother Harun brother Hassan thank you very much Jazakallah. don't forget trip Haji advisor. advisor. Haji advisor. So you heard it here first or second time because he's been on Living the Life before. That go on there, check out the reviews. Inshallah, put your reviews if you had the opportunity to go, and this will help to advise other Muslims. Uh, you know, it will help them to facilitate their once in a lifetime decision so don't think it as a criticism think it as something that would help other companies and organizations to up their standards for those individuals who are spending all their life savings to go on this once in a lifetime trip inshallah so jazakallah here and inshallah we'll see you after the break assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh